Can I write on the screen? Um, I think so. Uh, we're live, Susan. Hi, I'm Becky Robinson. Welcome. We are so glad that you've decided to join us today with Susan Fowler for Master Your Motivation. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We are a couple of minutes before the hour, but as you're arriving, we would love for you to take a moment to get familiar with the Zoom technology because we would love to interact with you throughout today's broadcast. So if you can take a moment and find the chat panel, and when you get to the chat panel, please select all panelists and attendees so that we can all see what you're posting. And if you don't mind, give us a, a shout out in the chat to let us know that you found it. Let us know where you're calling in from. Um, I know we might have an audience today from around the world and we would love to give you a shout out. Looks like many of you are finding that chat panel. Be sure to select all panelists and attendees so that you can engage with others throughout today's call. Wow, these locations are coming in so fast. It looks like we have almost every state. Um, um, and I'm not going to be able to read these fast enough. Welcome in Southern California, in Texas, in Florida, in Canada, in Cincinnati, Ohio, and in Indiana. We are so thrilled that you decided to join us today. And a special shout out to those who might be calling, I mean, watching us today on Facebook Live. We are also broadcasting on Facebook Live. So um, thanks to all of you who are letting us know where you're calling in from in the chat. Um, I had one other thought about something I wanted to know from you in chat. Oh, quite often folks will gather in a room at their organizations to learn from our experts. If you are with a group at an organization today, we are especially interested in hearing about that. So if you're in a big room and you have a group gathered all around the screen, um, please let us know and we'll give it a shout out to your organization. Um, I don't know if that's an organization. Crohn's guy from Central PA, Hornblower Cruises and Events must have a group together. Yeah. And hello in Zimbabwe. So a few other technical considerations today. If you are interested in sharing your learning as we go throughout today's event, you can use the hashtag master your motivation and we would love to engage with your tweets. Welcome at Markham LLP. Um, great that you're there with a group and joining our learning today. A few other things for today. Uh, we will be recording today's session. I haven't hit record yet, but we will be recording the session and we, we will make the recording available. And uh, the other thing to know is that we do have some beautiful slides today and Susan has agreed to share those via PDF. So we will be sending that with our follow-up materials after today's event. Wow, that's a whole lot, but feel free to answer any, ask any questions in the question panel throughout today's event. And Susan, I, I didn't stop to say hi. Welcome, it's so great to hi. see you. <laughs> that's quite all right, Becky. I think they're more important right now than I am, so. Oh, that's holy cow, yes. And we've got more people from Markham LLP. Um, so I'm not sure what Markham LLP does, but we hope that you have some great value from today's event. So for those of you who may not know Susan Fowler, I've had the pleasure of knowing and working with Susan for several years. And before we dive into today's content, I wanna take a moment to introduce her to you. If you have had previous exposure to Susan, we've done some webinars on the past on the topic of her first book, Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does. And that book is geared specifically for managers. If you bought that book when, um, when it came out, you're gonna be happy to know that her new book, Master Your Motivation, is more geared toward individual learners. So if you are a manager, you can benefit from reading it and um, those who work with you, every single one of them could benefit from reading this book. So we'll every talk one of them. Every single one of them, right, Susan? <laughs> Every single one. Um, so we're thrilled that you've chosen uh, to join us. And I'm trying to think, Susan, what the most important things are to say about you. Um, what stands out to me the most is that you have been an amazing friend and partner. I know that you have some um, amazing family members. You live in San Diego, California, and you've served with Ken Blanchard companies for many years as a consultant in addition to your own work, research, and speaking. Did I miss anything that you would like our attendees to know? No, I, I think we need to get to what the, they came for. Well, let's dive in. <laughs> I'm going to disappear for a few minutes. Please, again, continue to engage in the chat, and I'll be back on later, and we'll be able to take some of your questions toward the end of the hour. Thanks, Becky. Um, and by the way, Becky is practicing what I, I try to teach, and that is optimal motivation. She woke up this morning feeling really, really sick. And so um, we'll, talk, we'll talk about what it takes to have resiliency because your motivation is at the heart of, you know, everything you do. Um, and, um, and, so, and so 
you know, how does she deal with their motivation when she's just sicker than a dog this morning? So welcome, everyone. Um, you know, one of the things that Becky um, might have said would be that I'm a motivational speaker. And I'm glad she didn't say that because um, what I like to think of myself is uh, I speak about motivation, but I speak about the science of motivation. So what we're going to talk about today is how the science of motivation is really informing what we know about the nature of motivation and some, some major breakthroughs that I think literally can change the quality of our lives and maybe the quality of our world if, if we put it into practice, because motivation really is at the heart of everything you do. And it's also at the heart of everything you don't do, but wish you did. So what I'd like to encourage you to do is in the chat, if you would write down a goal or something that you have been wanting to achieve for the longest time, I mean, it could be personal, like maybe a weight loss or to, to exercise on a regular basis or to, um, to uh, practice random acts of kindness, or it could be to get your budgets or your expense reports in on time <laughs> for once uh, without, you know, creating a lot of anxiety. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm like just, you know, to be healthier, I'm seeing that to be, I love that, to be positive in every situation, uh, to be more organized. Um, so, so whatever it is for you, if you just put it in the chat box and I'm, I'm hoping that by the time we're done with our short little presentation, even though you might not have mastered your motivation, you're going to be on your way because, um, motivation is a skill and that is like an evolutionary idea that is, is really quite ex exciting. So some of you are th saying things like, you know, remove clutter and others of you are saying, I wanna start my own business. So what you might wanna work on is something that's routine, that influences every day of your life, or it might be that dream that you've always had if you only had the motivation to do it. So thank you, I'm gonna keep looking at, um, oh, I saw someone write a book. Anyway, these are so fascinating, but I've gotta move on. So keep them in the, in the chat box. Because we'll save the chat. <laughs> okay. There are um, so many. Thank you so much. I know much. it. I love it. I love it. Um, we had over a thousand people register for this webinar, so it's pretty exciting. Um, here's a, a groundbreaking insight from the science of motivation. You might not think that this is all that revolutionary, but the idea that we long to thrive is a major concept. Because if you think about it, many of us believe that by nature, people are lazy. Um, or that there's people in the workplace who don't mind being bored. But guess what? That is the furthest thing from the truth. The fact is we all long to thrive and thriving does not look like being bored, being disengaged, failing at our goals, not contributing to society. Those are just the antithesis of what um, it means to thrive. So the question really becomes if we long to thrive, what does it take to thrive? And that is where we've had the greatest um, groundbreaking um, ideas that, that you can thrive by creating choice, connection, and competence. In other words, that when you create these three psychological needs that in academic research, we call them nutriments, that they're so essential to our thriving, to our sense of well-being, that even if we achieve our goals, if we don't achieve our goals, while we're experiencing connection, competence, and um, excuse me, uh, uh, choice, connection, and competence, we will not flourish. And if we're not flourishing, we're not going to appreciate the fact we've achieved our goals, and we're not likely to sustain the effort or to be able to maintain a high level of productivity. So this is a major breakthrough in motivation science. So. Um, what I would really like to encourage us to do is to think about this whole idea of how do we satisfy, how do we create choice, connection, and competence? You know, think about this. If you want to generate energy to do something during the day, let's say you have low energy, you can either eat like a handful of almonds or you could drink a cup of coffee and have a sweet. Both of those actions are going to generate energy but the quality of the energy is going to be totally different. So think about this, when you're low energy and you have caffeine or sugar or carbs, what happens to your blood sugar? It gets a great spike. You have this burst of energy. Then what happens? Your energy plummets, your blood sugar plummets. And in fact, it goes lower than it was where it was when you began. So what do you need? 
You need more caffeine, more sugar, more carbs. So all day long, we're like on this roller coaster ride being controlled by sugar, carbs, caffeine, whatever our, our junk food of choice is. When we eat that handful of almonds, not only do we generate energy, but it's a different type of energy. It's more positive, it's more sustainable. It actually um, enables us to think more clearly, to be more creative, be more innovative. This same phenomenon of junk food energy and uh, health food energy is the same exact analogy to your motivation. That when you create choice, connection, and competence, it's like eating a handful of almonds. When those three things are missing, it is the equivalent of needing some kind of junk food motivation to get you to do something. And that is why we're so dependent on rewards, incentives, praising, external forms of motivation, fear, a power, status. All of those types of motivation come into play because we haven't understood that what we're really longing for, what we really need, what's really going to um, feed our soul as well as our psychological needs is choice, connection, and competence. So that is what uh, I'm um, ask you to think about today is that the truth about motivation is that not all motivation is created equal. Some motivation is high quality and high um, and optimal, and some motivation is low quality and suboptimal. So the, the question really becomes, how in the world do you do that? Well, you can experience a motivation breakthrough if you can develop the skill to create choice, connection, and competence. That's, that's really the essence of my, of my presentation today. So Susan, can we dive in? I'm so intrigued by this idea that we can experience a motivation breakthrough. So could we start by talking a bit about um, how choice plays into that? We can, and you know, I wrote Becky at like dawn this morning when she, she wrote me to tell me that she was not feeling well and that she was losing her voice. And we had a thousand people registered for a <laughs> webinar. Can you just imagine, you know? And so what Becky really realized is that she does have choice, connection, and competence. She had a choice to not be on the, on the webinar today. She could have just let me take it and run with it. She could have let Aubrey, who's behind the scenes uh, running things for us, she could have let Aubrey do this. But what I think she realized was that she has such a deep connection to her purpose, running Weaving Influence, to our friendship, to all of you that registered. And the fact is she really um, enjoys doing this. And so she made the choice to be here today. And I hope you can tell that um, she is optimally motivated to be here and she's practicing what we're teaching. And I have to tell you that at the end of today, she is going to feel such a sense of accomplishment and that's where resiliency comes in. Whenever she's really down and going, can I do something? She can always go back to moments like this and recall how powerful she felt when she was able to create choice, connection and competence and actually succeed at achieving her goals. So Becky, I just want to give a shout out um, to, to you. That's very kind. <laughs> okay, so let's just talk a little bit more about choice. Choice means that we have a need to perceive we have choices, to recognize and feel that we have freedom, but within boundaries. Those first two bullets are so critical because the fact is we might think, oh, I don't have choices. I have to do something. But the fact is we always can have the perception of choice. And if we had total freedom, because I want you to hear that choice is not the same as freedom, that if we actually had total freedom, we wouldn't be able to handle it. We wouldn't have the competence to deal with total freedom. I was actually talking to a young man this weekend who was highly successful financially um, at a young age. He was an entrepreneur, ended up selling his company to a Fortune 500 company, made millions and millions of dollars. And he said, I am more stressed now than I've ever been in my life. He said, because I have total freedom. I could work or not work. Um, I could do something, not do something. I get up in the morning. I have whatever, I, I could do whatever I want to do that day. He goes, I have so many choices. I don't know how to deal with it. So I want you to see that choice is not freedom. 
uh, because we wouldn't have the competence or the ability to handle all that freedom, or we'd have to develop a lot more competence to deal with it. So I think about if you work, for example, at a pharmaceutical company or in a financial institution, it looks like we have a lot of people from, um, I'm assuming that Markham might be a, a farm, I mean, a, um, a financial advisory company. I saw commercials for it this morning, I think on television. <laughs> I think those, that's right. But um, think about how regulated your industries are. And so what often happens is we have conversations about the boundaries, what's legal or not legal, um, especially if you're in pharmaceutical sales, for example. Um, but what we rarely really discuss and think about, what freedom do we have within those boundaries? What are our options? What could we do? And it's those kinds of conversations that generate creativity, that stimulate innovation, that give us a sense that that third bullet, we have a sense of control. You know, think about a baby who um, is um, just learning to eat um, regular food. I'm getting um, beautiful uh, emails right now from my niece and from my daughter, both of whom have little babies who are just learning to, to eat food, excuse me. And they're hysterical, aren't they? Because what they show you is like you're going with the spoon with your, to your baby's mouth. And if your baby's not ready for it, they just clomp down. You can't pry that mouth open. And then if they're not ready and you've got the spoon coming towards their mouth, they turn their face really fast and you get a smear of peas all over their, their face. Babies, even at a young age, recognize they have a need for choice. They have a need to feel like they're in control of what's happening to them. They will even try to grab the spoon and feed themselves, even though they don't have a competence to find their mouth, because they have this need to sense that, that they're in control of what's happening to them. So we all have this need. I think the thing that's the, the biggest challenge for us is to recognize that we always do have choices. Um, I love to read about people that have been, I don't, I don't know if love is the best word to say, I love to read, but I, I, I appreciate reading stories about people who have been in situations where you think they don't have any choices or where the choices are so abominable that you think, I, I don't know that I could make it through. I think of the young man from um, whose arm was caught in the rock and they made a movie about uh, that he actually cut off his own arm to escape. You know, you think, oh, he didn't have any choices. He had choices and, and he made those choices and now he's thriving. Um, I think about Viktor Frankl in a concentration camp where you might think he had no freedom whatsoever. He didn't have freedom, but he had choices. And once he recognized that there was a beautiful sunset in the midst of all the horror and that there was no way they could take that beautiful sunset away from him, that he could make choices every day to recognize beauty, to reach out and help someone else who was in um, a worse shape than he was in. That, that when we recognize those choices, we are on the, we are on the, uh, the beginning trail of, of, of flourishing, of, of thriving. So it's really important for us to recognize that we always have choices. Um, here's something that I, I've, I've really learned in my own life. I saw that in the chat that a number of us um, want to lose weight or, or uh, to be healthy. So what happens is we go on a diet or we get a health plan and we get this whole action plan of what we're going to do. But we're not optimally motivated to do it. In other words, we feel like we have to, our doctors told us to do it, or maybe it's our image, like I've got my 50th um, high school reunion coming up this summer. You know, I, oh, wow, I gotta look good for my 50th high school reunion. So those are like junk food reasons for being motivated to lose weight. So what happens is you get into it and you start thinking, I don't really have any choices. I have to, I have to eat right. I can't have that cookie. As soon as you say to yourself, I can't have a cookie, you are eroding your psychological need for choice. And what's the thing you want most? It's not the cookie. What you want most is choice. And so you choose to eat the cookie thinking that that's going to give you that sense of choice. So the reason diets don't work is because by their very nature, they erode our sense of choice. Instead, what we need to do is say, I always have choices. I could choose to eat the cookie I could choose not to eat the cookie. I'm choosing to not eat it. It sounds like too simple, but it is absolutely profound. 
when we accept that we always have choices and everything we do is a choice. That's the first psychological need. That's the first action we need to take if we're going to master our motivation. So powerful, Susan. And I'm, I'm encouraged because I think as we become intentional about realizing and being aware that we have choices, that's really a key to unlock um, kind of the power to make the choices that we want to make. So yeah. thank you for and, that. And let me just say this, because I just saw something in the chat box. You can't just have choice and master your motivation. What the science tells us is that you must have, and this is kind of the caveat, you must have all three psychological needs. It's almost like they're these magic elixirs. They're very powerful in and of themselves, but it's not until they're combined that the magic happens. So if I have connection and competence, but I don't have choice, I will not master my motivation. Hmm. Um, we require all three. And that's why we just need to start with choice, but all three are actually required. Well, let's talk now, Susan, about connection. How can we create connection? Okay, so first of all, we really need to understand what we mean by connection. Um, connection means that we have a sense of belonging and a genuine connection to others without concerns about ulterior motives. You know, just because someone's friendly to you doesn't mean you have a connection to them. If you feel like they're using you. There's a story that um, we always tell in our management seminars about a sales manager who's really driving for results. And he's got this one new salesperson who's just on fire. And the sales manager wants to make sure that that kid stays motivated to keep making the sales and making his numbers. So he takes him to this ridge here in San Diego overlooking what is the most expensive um, place to live in the United States of America called Rancho Santa Fe. If there's anybody here from there, put it in the chat box, I'd like to know you. Um, anyway, <laughs> he's overlooking these beautiful horse farms and mansions in Rancho Santa Fe. And from this ridge, the sales manager looks down and he's pointing out to this young salesperson, look at that ranch over there. Oh my gosh, they could probably board 10 or 12 horses. Look at the workout ring, isn't that exquisite? Look at that, look, but look at this, look at the pool that that one has. Can you imagine the parties you could have at that place? And he's pointing these beautiful properties out. And as he's pointing them out, the young man, his eyes are just wide with like, oh my gosh. And the manager says, son, if he's got his arm around the boy, son, if you keep working as hard as you're working, if you keep making the kind of numbers you're currently making, someday all of this could be mine. <laughs> and, and I love that story because a lot of, for example, sales reps or people in the workplace feel like the only reason their managers are leading them is because they're the ones that are going to benefit that if, if you don't have a genuine caring about the person you manage, or if you're the person being managed and you don't have a sense that your manager actually cares about you as a human being over and beyond the contribution you make at work, then you're not going to sense um, connection. We also though need to align with goals and actions that um, are aligned with meaningful values and a sense of purpose. This one's hard because there's a lot of us who don't know what our values are. There are a lot of us that go to work every day and we could tell you what the top five values are for the organization we work with. But if I was to ask you, what are the top five values that you use to make decisions every day? What are the top five values that guide everything you do throughout the day? Many of us would be hard pressed to actually state those values clearly and make them operational. So it's really difficult, it's really a challenge to feel a sense of connection to your work or your volunteerism or any task or goal or diet that you're going on if it's not attached to a more meaningful value. So for example, if you're on that diet, like I said, because you wanna impress people at your high school reunion um, or you're on a diet because your doctor told you you have to be on a diet. If you don't have a sense that, wait a minute, I value my body, I value, what God's given me to take care of, or I value the energy that I'm bringing to the world and my diet influences all of those things, then there's a real good chance you won't stick to that diet. So um, I think that before we start thinking about, for example, how we're going to lose weight, the first question we need to ask ourselves is why? 
Why are we losing that weight? And is our answer connected to meaningful values and a deeper sense of purpose? And it doesn't contribute to something greater than ourselves. So, so let me just give you an example. Um, there was a, a man I, I knew when I was living in North Carolina, his name was Roland. And Roland came from a long line of people who had worked on tobacco farms and he smoked. And I would say that he would almost feel, feel guilty if he wasn't smoking because it was like the family business. But he knew that he needed to quit smoking. His doctor had told him that over and over again. So he finally said, okay, I'm gonna quit smoking. So he tried using a patch, but he kept smoking and it made him sick. He tried chewing the gum, it didn't work. He actually found that there was an acupressure point in his ear that uh, if you press that, it reduces cravings. So he got his ear stapled and nothing was working. He couldn't quit smoking. So one day he's driving his car and he's smoking his cigarette and his three-year-old daughter is in the back seat and she yells out at him, daddy, can you please quit smoking? You're killing me back here. Roland says he put out that cigarette and he never smoked again. And in talking with him, what he came to understand was that he loved his daughter more than he loved smoking. So sometimes, sometimes giving up a bad habit, for example, whether it be the way you eat or smoking or um, not being positive, uh, gossiping, finding the negative, uh, being a pessimist, sometimes what it takes to overcome those things we wanna let go of is really understanding what we love more than the thing we're going to let go of. So connection is really about attributing meaning to the madness around you, especially when the madness is inside you. <laughs> you know, um, I get really mad and upset about a lot of what's happening in the world today. And what I found myself doing was complaining of, you know, actually contributing more darkness to what I thought was the darkness. And what I really began to realize is that um, maybe there's meaning to what's happening in the world today. Maybe we're evolving and everything we're going through is a way for people to really gain clarity around their values and, and the kind of people we want to be in the world. And that that's a positive. And what I needed to do was start to contribute to the positive aspect of what's in the world instead of adding to the, the darkness or the negativity. So um, connection is, I think, where we have the greatest opportunity to to change people's motivation at work. I think that we can help people shift their motivation. I mean, um, just another quick example, expense reports. You know, how do you attribute meaning to expense reports over and beyond, I, I need my money? Well, there's a, a woman named Jenny Luna at the Ken Blanchard Companies. And there's a story in my book that actually could have been my story, but it's my um, colleague's Calla. It's her story because Calla hated doing expense reports. But when it became clear that by not turning her expense reports in on time or done well, that Jenny Luna was getting hurt because it was Jenny Luna's job to make sure all the expense reports got in, that they were done right, and that they got submitted so that clients could get billed and the whole process of accounts uh, receivable could move forward. Once Calla understood that she wanted to do her expense reports not to get the money back, but to not hurt Jenny, uh, to contribute to Jenny's success. Calla started putting her expense reports, submitting them in on time and, and doing them right. And I just saw Calla again this weekend and she verified that, that Jenny Luna is still her inspiration. Um, giving back to Jenny is the meaning um, that, that allows her to do her expense reports. So, um, so yeah, so connection is, I think, the opportunity we have in the workplace to help people have a sense of connection, to, to not just throw out metrics without meaning, but to help people find meaning behind the metrics that we're trying to achieve. So it's very powerful. And I think uh, the important nuance that you brought out about connection is that we shouldn't automatically assume that creating connection is about relationships, but it's also connection to the meaning and the values that underlie um, those things that we're trying to do in our lives. So Susan, let's talk a little bit about competence. How can we create that sense of competence? Yeah, and um, this one's interesting because uh, it's, it's really working at two levels, that we need to feel effective at managing everyday situations. So if you're going into a meeting 
and you don't have a sense of um, that you can handle the dynamics in that meeting. Uh, maybe there's somebody in that meeting that just trips your trigger and you're worried that you might not self-regulate well. <laughs> um, maybe you don't um, like public speaking and you need to make a presentation. And, and so uh, you you're ang have anxiety around that. Um, those are the things that erode our competence. Um, we could, however, have great confidence that we can do it. Yeah, I can handle that that um, that person in the meeting who always trips my trigger. And yeah, you know, I'm a dynamic person. I can make a great presentation. But you can't just have the confidence to do it. At some point, you actually have to demonstrate that you have that skill. I think a lot of us have probably watched shows like American Idol, or I know that there's Canadian Idol and Indonesian Idol. And, you know, you see the competitions all over the world, these singing competitions. And there's people that really have confidence that they can sing, but they've actually never demonstrated the skill. And nobody has ever cared enough about them to tell them the truth. See, I think sometimes that we're afraid that feedback is going to kill our dreams. That if we give people negative feedback, that we're going to erode their motivation. But just the opposite is true. When we receive honest feedback, it is a way for us to, to continually improve and evolve. And if we understand that it's actually our need to feel a sense of growth and learning, then we should be open to that feedback. In fact, I feel so strongly about this that um, something that we've been advocating at the Ken Blanchard companies in our program called self-leadership um, since the early 80s is that we need to flip the feedback. That instead of in always encouraging managers and leaders to give feedback, what we really need to be doing is teaching individuals how to ask for feedback. And so what I do is with my, um, with the people in my life is I'm constantly asking them, what do you think I can do better? How did I do in this situation? And what would you have recommended I do differently? And, and so if we can be proactive about asking for feedback, it's going to go a long way into helping us to, um, to, to, uh, to actually uh, create our competence in our life. So um, I, I just get so discouraged with the workplace where we're constantly focused on goals that have outcomes and we're focused on those outcomes and those end results. So for example, if you're in sales and you have a sales goal, what typically gets discussed is where are you in terms of your numbers? Where are you in terms of your goals? Instead of having the conversation about Let's talk about what you've learned in the last week. Or what if we ask ourselves every day, what did I learn today that's going to help me be better tomorrow? We would go a long way to achieving our results, um, to uh, getting our outcomes, if we realized that building competence is the only way that eventually we will actually get those results. So, so ironically, when it comes to motivation, Focusing on results is really the fastest way to not get them. What we really need to be doing is every day um, recognizing that it's our nature to learn and grow and shift the focus to our growth and learning. That is so powerful, Susan. And uh, so the way to gain competence is to grow and learn every day. Um, yeah. And I love that um, idea of reflecting each day. It's something I, I wish I could remember to ask my kids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I've had so many parents tell me that, Becky. And so let me just, um, if I could, I'm going to just go back to one other slide real quick. That I just imagine this. What if at the end of every day, we simply asked ourselves or the others around us, let's talk about the choices we made today that we that we're glad we made. What choices do we wish we'd made? Or what choices did we make that we wish we hadn't? Just to focus on, wow, we did have choices. We were making choices. What if we asked ourselves or others every day, what gave you meaning today? Um, how did you find uh, val value in, in your work today? What did you do that actually aligned with your values? How, how did you help fulfill your sense of purpose today? Um, how did you contribute to the greater good? How did you improve the welfare of the whole? I mean, my gosh, those are such powerful questions. And what if we asked ourselves, how did I grow and learn every day? 
Um, I, I want to give a, um, a, a quick little example here. Um, there was um, a woman named Missy who was working with an energy company in Wyoming. And there was uh, something that she was do having to deal with multiple times a week. There was a lineman who would call in and he was really gruff and he was tough and he had complaints. And so she would have to hear his complaint so she could figure out who to, who to send him to. And it got to the point where people were saying, please don't send me his calls. You know, all he wants to do is complain. And I'm so sick of having to rationalize. So everyone was telling her, Missy, don't put his calls through. I'm busy. So Missy then one day after going through a training on motivation, she decided that she was going to choose to see if she could help him, hmm. if she could make a connection. If there was any way that she could demonstrate competence by dealing with his issues instead of just passing him on to someone else. Now, she's an administrative assistant. She graduated from high school, never went to college. And what happened was she recognized in talking to him that he had choices. He was a lineman out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody even knew actually what he did moment to moment. He could choose to do every day whatever he felt was most important. He had his own priorities. He also had competence. He had been a lineman for over 20 years. She recognized that what he didn't have was a sense of connection, that he didn't feel he belonged because he was out there in the wilderness all by himself. And so Missy just heard him out, asked him questions, talked to him, demonstrated empathy. Pretty soon, he started calling in just once a week, but asking for Missy. And they developed such an incredible friendship and relationship and the way I found out about this was I was at a conference and this young woman comes up to me. She says, Susan, do you remember me? And I could recognize her face, but I couldn't think of who she was. She goes, it's Missy from Precor. I went, oh my gosh, Missy, what are you doing here? She told me this story and she said, my president, the president of our, of our company was so impressed with what I did that he asked me what kind of conference or what might I want as, um, as a sign of gratitude for my effort. And, she says, and I chose to come here because I wanted to share this story with you. Oh, wow. So, I know. Isn't that cool? So it's just, it's, it's, I've just sh seen it. And what she really, I think, and I write about this in my book, that what I love about what Missy did was she demonstrated this for somebody else. But in so doing, it was her own choice, connection, and competence. It was her own motivation. And you talk about someone who then started to blossom and grow and recognize that she had so many more talents to give. Um, anyway, I'm just was really struck by by that example. That's a great one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So when we are able to demonstrate and generate and create choice, connection, and competence, um, it really changes the way we look at motivation. And so I think the time has come to challenge what we think motivation is and what it isn't. Um, and so I wanna just take a few minutes to challenge you. And I'd love if in this chat box, if um, and I see a lot of people just keeping notes and writing in the chat box, I just love that. So thank you so much. Um, but in the chat box, if you have any insights into any of these, um, I'd be curious about this because here's what has happened in the workplace that um, we have, um, been relying on competencies around motivation and a way of looking at motivation that's been proven either untrue or ineffective. And I've had the chance to write about this and I wanna offer you um, uh, this opportunity. Uh, this, this particular article toward a new curriculum of leadership competencies, advances in motivation science call for rethinking leadership development. Um, it was published last year in the Advances of Developing Human Resources. Um, and so what we do is really lay out um, why uh, what we know about motivation is wrong, mostly, and what we need to do to change that. Um, just uh, this year, a couple of months ago, um, a, a piece was published in the Frontiers of Psychology called Examining the Relationship Between Leaders' Power Use and Followers' Motivational Outlooks and Work Intentions. So this is the connection between motivation and power in the workplace. And then we also have a white paper um, from the Ken Blanchard companies uh, building a business case for why we need to think about motivation at work more, you know, di just differently um, and about optimal motivation. So if you're interested in receiving these three articles, 
Um, I can't just um, email them to you. Um, like if, if you're on a list, I couldn't just email these to you because these are journal articles. They need to be requested. And if you request it, then I can send you a PDF of it. So if you will text the word articles to um, the text number 66866, then um, you'll be prompted and uh, we'll send you those, those three articles will be to you by the time we end the session today. Or, well, just you know, to note, that only works for people who are in the United States. So if you happen to be from outside of the United States and you can't text for the articles, we'll make another way for you to get in touch with Susan. To, to oh, good. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I, I forgot about that. And yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that happens by the end of, of the session today. Okay. So, so think about this. Most of the way we look at motivation is based on research that was done in the 1940s. Um, on animals. And so we just we discovered that if you gave pigeons rewards, you could get pigeons to do whatever you wanted them to do. And the researchers said, oh, well, that's really interesting. Uh, if it works for pigeons, it'll probably work for people. And guess what? It did. And so that is where we really got the carrots and the sticks. Let's give people carrots. Let's promise them rewards, incentives, praising, status, power, enhanced image. Let's, let's promise them the corner office. Let's promise them all those things to motivate them to do what we want them to do. The problem is, is what the research now says, is that that way of motivating people doesn't work. And it's taken us a long time. Well, excuse me, when I say it doesn't work, it works in the short run. But even in the short run, it has... Um, diminished effectiveness because people are not as creative, they're not as innovative, and they actually suffer mental and physical ill-being by being controlled by things outside themselves. Because this, if, if you are doing something for the external reward, then you are not actually experiencing choice, connection, and competence. Those external rewards actually rob you of ulterior reasons for doing what you're doing that are more meaningful and sustainable. So it's not that we don't want money. We all want money. Um, we even love praising, but that should not be the reason we do what we do. Money and, and status and all of those other things are byproducts of doing what we're doing for healthy reasons of choice, connection, and competence. So external motivation can trick you into believing that rewards compensate for being miserable. How many times you said, oh, I don't get paid enough to do this job. So you go in and you ask for more money. What you're really longing for, even though you might deserve more money and it's an issue of fairness, the fact is what you're longing for is more meaning. What you're longing for is a genuine connection. What you're longing for is fairness. And so the more we understand the true nature of our motivation, uh, the better. But the fact is we've got so embedded in our collective psyche, these ideas of carrots and sticks that we haven't really explored the alternatives. That's what I'm asking you to do today, is just to begin to explore the alternatives. Um, it can be really rewarding. Think about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This is the most popular uh, motivation theory in the world. You might be surprised, and if you want more information about this, um, if you look at a blog I just recently wrote for Smart Brief, which is on my website, or you can go to Smart Brief on leadership, um, uh, I cite the research behind, uh, behind the fact that Maslow, this is not his pyramid. He didn't create this. He wrote some papers on what psychological needs we might have and creating a hierarchy, but an advertising guy thought that was pretty interesting and created this, this pyramid. It's never been empirically proven. And even Maslow wouldn't have approved of, of this hierarchy becoming the most popular theory and motivation. He served a really powerful purpose, um, which led to where we are today about psychological needs. But let's be clear that um, Maslow's hierarchy should not be the basis of our motivation, because the fact is that we can always shift when we proactively create choice, connection, and competence. We can self-actualize any time and any place. So we don't have to go through those layers of needs in order to actually experience optimal motivation. And if you read stories of people, as I said, who have been in horrible conditions, who have been able to thrive and flourish despite their conditions, they actually prove the point that um, we don't have to have all those needs met in order to experience self-actualization. And then finally, I just wanna say that one of the great ways that we um, train leaders um, in our workplace 
is to depend on their power, is to use their power to motivate people. And that's why the title of my, my last book, Why Motivating People Doesn't Work and What Does, was based um, on this um, trying to uh, actually undermine, if you will, or to, to try to dispel the myth that if when leaders use power, that they can motivate people. What our own research found, um, and that's one of the research papers that if you uh, um, text 66866, this is one of the papers you'll receive, uh, is the, the um, scientific evidence that there is no form of leadership power that can help people be optimally motivated and experience choice, connection, and competence. But almost every form of leadership power will lead to suboptimal motivation where either choice, connection, or competence, or all three are eroded. So we've got to start to teach leaders how to not depend on their power in terms of creating a motivating environment for people. And we've got to stop treating business as if it isn't personal. So we've got to teach leaders different types of skills because every decision that gets made, every interaction that we have at work actually is affected. Um, and, and it affects our energy, our income, our opportunities, and our future. So we need to stop that idea that, oh, it's not, it's not personal, it's just business. What we really need to say is, if it's business, it's personal. And that means we need to take, um, take seriously our needs and the needs of others to um, experience choice, connection, and competence. So Susan, um, before we go to questions for our attendees, I was wondering if you could share with us an example about how you've mastered motivation in your own life. Yeah, um, <laughs> this might sound trivial to some, but I just want to demonstrate how even something routine can be shifted uh, and make a difference in your life. So I travel a lot for my work. And one thing I'll never have a choice to do is to go through security. You know, if you're at the airport, you have to go through security. So I would go through with suboptimal motivation. Oh, I hate security. I have to go through security. And I didn't feel like there was much of a connection either because I've seen studies that show that maybe going through security isn't as effective as we think it is. And I, anyway, I didn't feel like there was a, a great deal of meaning about going through security. So my choices eroded. My connection was eroded. I had competence. I've been traveling long enough that I've got it down pretty well. So one day I'm at the airport. And as usual, I'm just like all uptight and, and impatient. And I actually have a process. <laughs> I would scan the lines and see which line is moving fastest. And I would be sure to not get in a line that has a family. And <laughs> forgive me, men, um, this is going to sound really sexist, but it's, it's really, I don't know. I, I wouldn't get in a line with a lot of men because I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but men they take off their jackets and they fold them nicely and they put them in the bin and then they take the stuff out of their pockets and put it in the dish and, you know, and they take off their belts and roll them. And women, we just kind of throw it all in, you know, or we slap our purse in there. So I find that women actually go through faster than men do. But anyway, that's just my observation. So um, I also then look at the TSA agent. I, make, I want to make sure I don't get someone who's really obsessed with quality. Um, or process, you know, somebody who's more willing to just kind of let things slide. So anyway, I, I have my process. So this one day I'm like full of angst and I got to get through the line and I, I catch myself and I have to laugh. I go, oh my gosh, here I am getting on a plane to go teach people about motivation and how to reduce pressure and tension and stress. Because when you're suboptimally motivated, that's, those are the keys that you, you know, you need discipline, you need willpower because you're pressed and, 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 and depressed and, so I just had to laugh at myself. And I said, Susan, it might help you practice what you teach. And so I said, okay, okay. So I need to create choice. How do I create choice? Well, I could choose to go through security, not for the reasons they want me to, but for my own reasons. So what would be my reasons for going through security? And I thought, okay, I could go through um, security so that I could live one of my values. Okay. What's a value I have? Oh, okay. I value learning. I really, that's my, probably one of my top values is learning. Okay, what can I learn by going through security? I could learn patience. That would be unique. And so I suddenly had a sense of choice and connection and I already had the competence. So I said, okay, cool. How do I demonstrate this? How do I actually demonstrate that I'm doing this? Because motivation is a skill. I'm going to get in the worst line. So I found a doozy. I found a line that was not only a little bit longer, but it had a family. 
And this family <laughs> was the kind of family you don't want to get behind. Uh, it was a young couple and they had two kids, a toddler and a newborn. And I did not know that you could go through security with that much stuff. And so <laughs> they are, you know, just struggling to get all this stuff up on the belt. And the father looks at me and he says, you know, we could be a, a little while, you know, do you, do you want to go ahead of us? And I, I so at first wanted to say, oh yeah, thank you. And then I thought, oh no, no, I'm practicing patience. I didn't say that out loud, but I, I said, no, thank you. Go ahead. And so I'm watching and it's painful. And so finally I say to them, um, excuse me, uh, I hope you don't think this is strange, but would it help if I held your baby? And they said, oh, would you? And I said, yes, I love holding babies. So I'm holding this baby and he's darling baby. As so I'm holding the baby and they're getting their stuff and they start to go through security. I say, excuse me, uh, you want your baby? And they're oh, no. <laughs> So I hand them their baby. And then on the other side, I hold the baby while they pack everything up and we go to our gates and I'm standing at the gate and I'm thinking, wow, that was really fun. I got to hold a baby. I love babies. And I see the father approaching me and he comes up to me and he goes, oh, I'm so glad I found you. He said, we were so embarrassed. You were so helpful. And we didn't even thank you. He said, this is the first time we've ever traveled with two kids. We had no idea how hard it would be. And we don't know that we could have gotten through security without you. And then we didn't even thank you. So I just wanted to find you and let you know that you really helped us today. And, and thank you. And I went, oh, oh, no, no, thank you. I love holding babies. He goes, no, you really went out of your way. I said, no, thank you. So we were like, finally, I had to get on my plane. Um, and so I, I got on the plane and I'm sitting in my seat and I'm just reveling. I'm feeling so positive. Now, I literally had a burst of energy and I was reflecting on that because this is what you really need to do uh, to practice the skill of motivation. You need to identify the current type of motivation you have. You need to understand if you have choice, connection, and competence. And then you shift the quality of your motivation from suboptimal to optimal by making sure that you do have a sense of choice, connection, and competence. And then you reflect on it because what the science says is that when your psychological needs are being satisfied, when you can create those in your life, it feels so good, you want more of it. And I sat there and I said, this feels so good. I wanna do this more often. And now anyone who, um, who I've ever traveled with will tell you, I actually look forward going through security. Who can I help? How can I make a difference? Maybe if it's just being friendly to a TSA agent, or helping a couple who doesn't understand, you know, how to go through, uh, to, you know, what to take off and what not to take off. So um, I encourage you, uh, a little shift perhaps, but something that was routine in my life has now become something that adds to the quality of my life. So I guess, you know, Becky, that's a, a, an example. Um, I have a million of them because a day doesn't go by that I don't reflect on my choices, my connection and my competence. Motivation is the energy to act. And so the quality of your motivation will determine the quality of your energy. And that energy will be so much more optimal if you are experiencing choice, connection, and competence. Thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, I'm watching the time and I'm well aware that folks might have comments or questions that they want uh, to talk about, and we will only be able to get to a few, but I have good news for you. Susan is available for what we call the after party. And toward the end of the hour, we're going to put a Zoom link to a Zoom meeting where you can actually come on camera and talk to Susan or share your comments with her. And that will begin as soon as this webinar ends. We'll also put that link in the Facebook Live link on the Weaving Influence Facebook page. So if you miss it here in the Zoom panel, you can go over to Facebook and get that link. Um, Aubrey has put the after party link. Don't click it yet, just copy it. And when this event concludes, um, you can go ahead and meet us over at the after party for about 15 to 20 more minutes of talking with Susan live face to face in a more casual env environment. So we do have a few minutes to take a couple of questions. And if uh, all of you have shown extreme competence in using the chat panel, <laughs> so we can invite you um, to go ahead and put your comments and questions there. And uh, while you're doing so, there are a couple of housekeeping notes. Yes, we will have. Um, the recording of today's session and be sharing it through our follow-up email and we will send a pdf of today's slides so that you can review them later i was funny susan someone said it was funny yay i think you're funny um, looking no <laughs> yeah so um yeah, this is a really uh tr tricky question but i'll ask it because uh, tanya has typed it twice trying to make sure it's on my radar she's okay. wondering what happens if someone is depressed and how you can help them have their 
needs for choice, competence, and connection met? Yeah, um, I was actually uh, talking uh, this this weekend. Um, I was had the privilege of um, we did the final class at the University of San Diego. Um, my husband and I teach in a program called Masters of uh, Science and Executive Leadership, and we got these students for the first week of their two year journey, and then we get them for the last weekend. And so this weekend we were uh, talking about motivation, and one of the women there said that she had had a conversation with somebody. Um, in her, that she, that she's a leader of, somebody who reports to her. And this person was really depressed at work. They, they didn't feel that um, what was being asked of her was fair. The company was uh, in really dire straits. It was a very depressing environment to begin with. And, and this, this woman felt like um, she would have needed to have psychological knowledge or be a psychologist, be a professional to have that conversation with this woman. And so what I asked her to do was, was actually practice what we had just learned. And, and it was remarkable, um, just in a practice setting, what she asked this woman after she heard her out and, and why she'd be depressed and why, why things were bad and just all the woe is me kind of stuff, you know, really listening and being empathetic. And then to really ask just a series of three questions to say something like, I really understand why this would be challenging for you at this time in your life. Let's talk about the choices you do have. Um, it sounds like a lot of the choices that you feel like that you don't have, but let's talk about the ones you do have. Or it sounds like you're really restricted in the choices you have, but let's talk about the freedom that you have within those boundaries. And then to ask, ask um, let's talk about the choices you've made recently and how you felt about those. Have you made choices that you thought were good ones? Have you made choices you wish you hadn't made? You know, why is that the case? And then to, after the choice conversation, to have a, a, a conversation about connection and to be able to say, you know, let's talk about your values. You know, is there anything that you're doing now that could help you to fulfill your values? Or let's just talk about how you could find meaning in this madness. Um, how, even though this is a challenging environment, what could you, um, what could you gain uh, in terms of resiliency? You know, let's just talk about how you could find meaning in this time. And then finally, what are you learning and growing? You know, you might learn something that you're not going to be able to use in your current job. You might not even have a job a month from now, you know, the way things are going. I understand that you're fearful about that. So what could you be learning now that no matter what happens in a month from now, you could use that um, as you move forward. It would help you to move forward more positively. So again, I just think if we could... Um, what happens, by the way, when you ask those questions is that you're creating a mindful space for people to think about positive things that, that satisfy those psychological nutrients, that get them away from the thoughts that depress them. There has been so much work in clinical psychology about the power of choice, connection, and competence with anorexics, with drug addiction, with depression. And so I don't think you have to be a clinical psychologist to ask questions that are, demonstrate empathy and that in, in enable that person to have a mindful moment. And research, neuroscience research shows that when people are in a mindful state, they automatically are also lighting up the same part of their brain as when choice, connection, and competence are being experienced. So that was a long-winded answer. I know that we now No, that was a great answer. Susan, if we can go to the next slide, there are some folks asking about the text number where they can get the articles. Um, so you can text the number 66866 and the word articles to receive those articles that Susan was offering er earlier in the broadcast. And I want to make sure all of you know that Master Your Motivation is going to launch and be available June 4th. I'm so excited for Susan for the new launch. And one of the best ways that you can help us get the word out about motivation and the ideas that you heard today are to pre-order Master Your Motivation. If you pre-order today, you'll get it in your mailbox, um, you know, as, as soon as it launches. Um, so we encourage you to do that. And again, we mentioned earlier in the call that why motivating people doesn't work and what does is really geared toward managers who want to help those um, that they're leading. And so if you're a manager and you haven't had exposure to why motivating people doesn't work and what does, you can get that on Amazon as well. And then you can get Master Your Motivation for every single <laughs> person on your team, right? <laughs> hey, um, Becky, can yes, I just say something real quick? The audible version of Master Your Motivation, I'm so um, excited about it because 
I actually had 13 different people telling their stories from Jean-Paul Richard, who is an Olympic gold medal uh, coach, and he's now the head of artistic coaches for Cirque du Soleil. Uh, he wrote the forward, and he actually reads the forward himself. Ken Blanchard did the afterward, and he reads the afterward himself. And then we have the stories of um, uh, at least 11 people who actually tell their stories about mastering their motivation, and we got each one of them to tell their own story in their own voice. So it's not just listening to me read the book. You're actually going to hear people telling their own stories, which I think is really unique. That is so amazing. Well, I'm really so, excited about and it. a good reason to get the audio version. And did you, did I hear it right? You can get that now? Um, well, you can order it now, but you okay. wouldn't get it until it releases in June, on June 4th. Got it. And so for those of you who are asking about getting the articles outside the U.S., we will be sending a follow-up email this afternoon. And in that email, we'll give you some information about how you can get the articles if you're outside the U.S. or if you've had some difficulty, as some of you had with the text um, technology. So I want to remind you again that we are going to join for an after party on the Zoom link that, Aubrey, if you could repost that again in the chat so everyone can copy it and join us. Um, you will be able to come on camera and open up your microphone and talk directly to Susan about these topics related to motivation. And we would love to welcome you over there. So Susan, thank you so much. Um, it is amazing to be able to share this hour with you and I'll see you over at the after party. Sounds good. I hope you all join. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Be optimally motivated. <laughs>